Monica, of Good course. Good morning. <laughs> morning. Monica Winfield live from Red's car this morning. Oh, Rupal, you won't believe what's happening outside the hotel. Um, I, you've, you've heard the seagulls, you can hear the waves. Now, just out of a side road near our hotel, comes a tractor pulling a trawler, a fishing boat. Because there's a, there's a you know, a, a fully working uh, fishing fleet uh, that goes out of Redcar. And clearly, it's an early morning start for a couple of fishermen who are just taking their boat down to the beach. Brilliant! Completely seasidey. Um... I'm in red car because there is a very strong link between the Leicester branch of the RNLI and the lifeboats here at uh, red car. Now, red car's not the nearest place to Leicester as far as seaside is concerned. So when I spoke yesterday to Derek Young, who is the chairman of the Leicester branch of the RNLI, the first thing I wanted him to explain was how this relationship between Leicester and red car had started in the first place. Well, originally, then chairman, John Sutton, made a stipulation that the boat was to go on the east coast which we thought you know Skegness, Hunstanton, Wells next to you, somewhere like that but no it was Red Car which was on the east coast of course uh, that's what the RNLI decreed that that's where they wanted the boat and so they that's where it was to go I have to say we didn't know a lot about Red Car at that point but since then we've raised the money for three lifeboats which was great. I'm as pleased to say the previous one. I actually named that boat. You did. You got the champagne popping I and did. everything. It I was... did have a sack too. <laughs> <laughs> Two years ago, it was my birthday weekend. Here we are, it's my birthday weekend again. I had a big party for my big birthday two years ago and donated the money in lieu of presents to the RNLI. Can I, Derek, say that part of that boat was bought by me? Oh, I think so. Why not? <laughs> and if anybody else wanted to do something like that, yeah. you know, just because we're miles away from the sea doesn't mean we can't support the no, lifeboats. Of course it doesn't. I mean, it's a national, it's a national charity. Um, all right, people look at the balance sheet. Oh, they're a wealthy lot. Why should I give money to them? But what people don't realise, if we stop receiving money tomorrow, we've only got enough money to keep running for six months. Now, uh, that is, you know, scary. That is a frightening thought. No yeah. RNLI within six months if not another penny came in. Yeah, basically that's it, yeah. So finally, you never rest on your laurels. No. What's, what's next for the Leicester branch? Right. At the moment, we were raising money because all the, there was a new development in life jackets, so all the crews are to have the latest life jackets. Uh, we raised the money to replace the, the life jackets in Haysborough, and now we're on the, raising the ones to, raise, uh, to replace the ones at Wells next to sea. Now, this lifeboat to £204,000, how much is a life jacket by comparison? £350. Small change. Yeah. Small change, but absolutely vital, isn't it? It's not about the big things yeah. necessarily. It's the equipment that goes with it. Oh, yeah, that. very much so. And uh, well, you can see by this one out here, the equipment that's on it wasn't on when you saw the 75 here before. Yeah. That's Derek Young explaining the relationship between Leicester and Redcar and how that began. Uh, Monica Winfield, of course, live from Redcar this morning. She stood yesterday, did you not, Monica Winfield, uh, at the uh, naming ceremony and talking and finding out a lot about uh, uh, the lifeboat uh, in Redcar. I did indeed, yes. Now, you can hear a different acoustic immediately, I'm sure. Um, we've come away from the hotel. We've just walked down the high street in Redcar to the lifeboat station, which is uh, right opposite the seafront and is just a super place. There's a lovely atmosphere when you walk in, and we're actually in the part where the boat the boat uh, where Leicester Challenge 3 is housed and uh, she's pointing seawards uh, ready to go at, uh, at any moment. Uh, hopefully that's not going to happen while we're here because uh, there's lots of people coming in to see us and it would be nice to be able to uh, look at Leicester Challenge 3 as we talk about her. Uh, she really is beautiful. If you follow me on Twitter, Mon W R L, um, I'm on Twitter and I've just tweeted a photo of the boat um, at rest in the lifeboat house. So if you want to have a look at her, um, she's there. She's an inshore boat, uh, so she's not, you know, perhaps what you would typically think of when you think of a lifeboat. Um, she's uh, bright orange and uh, with uh, four crew members and two large engines at the back. But don't let me try and describe a boat because I spoke yesterday to a gentleman called Gareth Wilson 
Um, and he told me in some detail all about the, the main features of the Leicester Challenge 3, which is an Atlantic 85 lifeboat. The 85 replaced the Atlantic 75. What the additional features of this boat are, was well, first of all, it's an extra metre longer, just or thereabouts. It's about eight and a half metres longer. It's that little bit faster. This one's capable of 35 knots. And it's got some really u useful equipment on board now. It's got a radar for working out where casualties are, especially in, in fog or rough weather. And um, they can actually sit on top of the slipway and identify where those casualties are. And one of the most important things it's now got is what they call a DF set, which is a direction finder. And any of the radio equipment that's getting broadcast in the area, we can actually pick that up and tell what direction it's coming from. And if we are talking to the person, we actually say to them, count one to ten and then we can home in on them quite easily, so it's really useful. So, the message is, make sure you take a radio to see with you, not your mobile phone, a radio every time, then we can come and get you quicker. It's got a navigation suite on it, so it's GPS or DGPS, which is a bit more accurate, um, so the boat knows where it is exactly at the same time, obviously where the land is, which is quite important, and also where the other vessels may be if they're carrying the same equipment. So that's really important. But the other thing it's got which is useful is an extra person and the crew, the volunteers are the utmost importance to the RNLI. Those volunteers go in all kinds of weathers and what we need to do for them is make sure they're as safe as possible. And more and more with a 75 which is the, the previous boat, there was only three seats but they needed four people. So what we've done is put an extra seat on the back of that. Um, so they carry a crew of four which is really, really useful for some of the more technical services. So all of these things are just added bits to this lifeboat which makes it a superb craft. Clearly, you're very proud of it. You can see the crew absolutely love their new boat to bits. There was one stat that you did during the service that I think will really, for us landlocked to Leicester people, will really kind of illustrate what the boat can do. Tell me about the engines on the back. The engines now, um, there used to be 90 horsepower engines on the back, but they were two-stroke engines. And those engines, we had to put oil into them to make them run and lubricate them. These are four-stroke engines. It's similar engine to what you'll find in a car. On the back, basically, is two Ford Fiestas, which are powering the thing through the water um, at 35 knots. It's a fantastic machine. But the other thing as well, because we're not having to put any oil or anything in that fuel, then that means that they're more environmentally friendly. And like anything nowadays, cars and everything else, economy comes into it. This boat's quite economic for the work that it does. So through and through, the Aaron lies looking at all of the areas. Um, the environmental issues are one of them, but the most important one is saving lives at sea. That's Gareth Wilson. He's the training divisional inspector. And he was describing uh, Leicester Challenge 3, an Atlantic 85 lifeboat. Uh, that uh, little chat took place after the official service of dedication. And a little bit later on this morning, we're going to hear from Rachel Harrison, uh, who conducted the service of dedication. And uh, there's a Leicester connection there, uh, which I think you'll find quite interesting. Um, later on, we are going to talk to senior helmsman here at uh, Red Car. That's Mike Picknett, and uh, quite an emotional chat uh, Mike and I had, uh, so uh, you'll hear that. And hopefully we'll be able to also include a little bit of music, because the Mask Fisherman's Choir uh, were singing throughout yesterday afternoon, uh, the proceedings there. Just to tell you a little tiny bit about uh, Red Car Lifeboat Station, it is um, one of the oldest lifeboat stations, and actually is home of the oldest lifeboat in the world, uh, the very first lifeboat uh, built by Henry. Henry Greathead is called the Zetland and it was placed on service in Redcar and it's in a museum just down uh, the high street from this modern day lifeboat station. Uh, the lifeboat crews here have been presented with more than 10 awards for gallantry through the years and I'm very much hoping that uh, when I talk to an old friend of BBC Radio Leicester, Dave Camish, he will talk us through some of those awards and some of the, some of the more notable uh, rescues that have been carried out by lifeboats here at Redcar. So, RuPaul, there's loads still to come um, from a red car as we look back at yesterday's service of dedication and we look forward to many years of faithful service from Leicester Challenge 3. Fantastic. I also understand we're going to hopefully be here the lifeboat. You've uh, been there uh, since yesterday, haven't you, Monica? Yes, absolutely. Nine o'clock yesterday morning, the Saturday breakfast programme finished. Uh, producer Becca and I leapt into a fast car and headed up to Redcar. And uh, it's just lovely. The sun's now fully up. 
Um, and uh, it's a bit of an angry looking sky, but Redcar actually um, is going to be very busy later on today. Not that it wasn't busy yesterday for the naming ceremony, but it's actually Redcar's half marathon. So all the sweet uh, streets are being swept, um, all the barriers are being put up to um, to keep the people interfer from interfering with the runners. Um, and uh, part of their route will take them along the seafront. And the seafront at Redcar is actually being redeveloped. It's it's being absolutely transformed. There's a new sea wall. Um, there is um, something that I was told yesterday um, is an upright pier. You know how a pier normally goes into the sea? This one goes up into the sky. Very entertaining. Um, and even as I speak, there's an Alsatian on the beach with his owner running rings round the seagulls. It's just brilliant um, because we're at the lifeboat house in Redcar um, to really bring you a flavour of the service of dedication and the naming ceremony that took place for Redcar's newest life boat um, a lot of the funds have been raised um, by the Leicester branch of the RNLI in order to give Redcar their new lifeboat now the naming ceremony was the pop of champagne corks and a round of applause and it was everything that you would expect uh, but there is a religious side as well to a naming ceremony and the service of dedication took place yesterday afternoon it was conducted by the Reverend Rachel Harrison and after the service had finished, um, I just had a, a bit of a chat with her and asked her whether a service of dedication is a normal part of the job for a seaside vicar. I think it is, but it's the first time that I've done it. I've only been in this parish for a few months, so I've not had the privilege of doing this before, but I know certainly my predecessors have. Not been in this parish for long because, for some of your time, you've been in Syston. We found another Leicester connection. How brilliant. What were you doing there? Uh, it's a few years since we left Syston. My husband, Bruce, was the curate at St Peter and Paul Church. It's nothing at all like being in the <laughs> sea. I'm very aware it's as far from the sea as you can get. But yes, for me, it was a really good time in Syston. I was involved in voluntary activities and I got to know people really well. Today, we've had a glorious afternoon, beautiful sunshine, a little bit blowy, but a really lovely service that was attended by many people from Redcar and from Leicester. Just tell me a bit about the role of a service of dedication. Why can we not just pour champagne on the boat and let it go? Why is there always a religious element to this? I think for many people, even if they're not particularly religious or they don't go to church, there's a sense of doing what they think is the right and the traditional thing. And the traditional thing always is to dedicate boats before they go to sea. And I think in a lot of seafarers, there is a, an inborn respect for the creation. And they see and experience things that many of us never can while they're on the sea. And so I think it's right that we have that Christian aspect. They're hardworking and hard-playing guys and women sometimes. And so they wouldn't call themselves churchy, I'm quite sure. But they do just have that within them that recognises something much greater is there. And they really enjoy having that aspect of their life. Mm. Oh. <laughs> the, the vicar uh, at the seaside... Uh, would you would you believe there you go uh, monica winfield is live at uh, red car uh, this morning at the uh, naming ceremony she was just talking there a, a little bit about the the role of the uh, seaside vicar monica winfield it sounds like it was a lovely ceremony actually do you know, Rupert, it was absolutely beautiful. It wasn't the first one that I'd been to, and so I kind of knew um, what the order of service was going to be. But there is just something very special um, about seeing all the lifeboat crew in their, in their uh, sort of formal uniforms. And uh, uh, something like this, where you've got a mixture of people from Leicester and you've got a, a mixture of um, people who are um, very much associated with the town of Redcar. It was a real coming together um, of, the, of the two towns. So we, and we we sang the hymns that you would expect when your anchor hold in the storms of life um, and for those in peril on the sea there were prayers there were readings and uh, and a blessing of course at the end um, and it was just a really really lovely occasion if you want to get a flavor of life in red car and life at the lifeboat station um, you can go onto facebook because there is now a gallery of photos on our facebook page and the way to find that obviously go online facebook 
facebook.com slash BBC Leicester. And uh, if you uh, follow me on Twitter, um, you will also see that I've put one or two photos up. And in fact, you can follow um, RNLI Redcar on Twitter as well if you want to. And I'm sure they put uh, details of the launches and the work that they're doing um, day in, day out. Um, follow them on Twitter and um, and you'll, you'll be able to follow the progress of Leicester Challenge 3. Um, a wee bit later on this morning, I'm going to be talking to Dave Camish and we're going to be talking about rescues. Um, he has quite a dramatic story to share with us um, a wee bit later on. Um, and then uh, Mike Picknett, the senior helmsman here, um, he got quite emotional talking about the, um, the lifeboats and his life, his career on the lifeboats. And you'll hear that just before nine. So Roops, there's still loads to come from the seaside this morning. And... Um, it's just lovely to be here, to be honest with you. Can we do this every week? Yeah, let's, shall we? Uh, look, stay where you are, Monica. <laughs> exactly what happened yesterday. Indeed I have, and meeting some of the instrumental people that actually made it happen. Uh, we're here at the uh, Lifeboat House at uh, Red Car, and uh, funnily enough, um, I mentioned uh, an Alsatian running around on the beach earlier on. Uh, the dog's just come off the beach with its owner, who turns out to be the chap who was driving the lifeboat yesterday after the naming ceremony, um, commonly known as Revo. Um, and he gave us his proper name's Mark, but he gave us a big wave, and uh, a huge amount of fun was had by all. Dave Camish has been a friend of BBC Radio Leicester's and uh, and associated with the Red Car Lifeboat for ages and ages and ages. You have a new title since last we met, Lifeboat Operations Manager, Red Car Lifeboat Station. Dave, good morning. Hello. Good morning, Princess. <laughs> oh, <darling. laughs> it's going no, really well. What a lovely day yesterday was, wasn't it? We couldn't have hoped for better. And I think, like, when you've been on holiday and you come back and you're telling the folks... If you say, <clears throat> I would go again tomorrow, you've got to say something about your holiday. And if uh, our flag day, or our naming ceremony, was to be next Saturday, there isn't a single, not a single item or issue that I would change. It was absolutely spot on. And uh, we're so grateful to everybody for helping us. There's one thing that I've noticed about lifeboat people, and I spoke to no end of people yesterday, but they're very modest about their achievements. So what I wanted from you today, if you would be so kind, it's a heroic job. It's, it's a very brave job. It's an extraordinary person that carries a pager with them, drops everything when that pager goes off, and rushes into the sea. And I know you've had your fair share of dramatic moments, so have you got one you can share with us this morning? Yes, I, I mean, we, we do typically 50, 60, 70 jobs a year, and, and that encompasses everything, um, from the sad ones, from the funny ones, to, you know, everything, the whole spectrum. And, uh, you know, we, we can but pick out one or two of them. Um, one that comes to mind um, uh, that hasn't happened in the last year, but was one involving a windsurfer on a very, very windy day uh, who had... He'd gone to sea on his board, hadn't been missed, but when he, he was missed, they worked out um, at least four hours he'd been missing, and it could have been six. And by the time our pages went, we were told that the, a search was centred on a particular area of the sea, uh, shall we just say to the west of Redcar. Uh, very quickly, um, both myself and the helmsman, again Revo, oddly enough, um, that was going to take the boat. We just thought about it, and our instinct told us that they were searching in the wrong place. So we figured downwind, down tide, and uh, uh, to the east of Red Car. The lifeboat launched, uh, went off there to the east. Um, he stopped about two to three miles off Red Car to set up a search pattern. Uh, whilst doing so, one of the crew members spotted something in the water. Uh, indicated it. They thought they'd just have a quick look beforehand and of course you're ahead of me now. It was the guy that we were looking for. Now, the, the pull the guy into the water, he was, he was face down in the water most of the time. He was deeply, deeply unconscious and we thought we'd lost him mm. before we even recovered him to the boat. Um, but the lads managed to get an airway into him, a little plastic airway that cost about 75p and set off for the shore uh, with a helicopter on standby to pick him up and take him away. Now, I, I take you a long way forward uh, to the time when he was discharged from hospital, maybe two or three weeks later or something like that. And he came to see us, and we, we thought we could fill in the last few details on the sheet for the, for the RNLI. 
and it came name, play, date of birth, place of birth and so on, and then occupation. And when it came to occupation, he astounded us because it turned out that he was um, a surgical consultant within the National Health Service in a neighbouring county. And, and all that I said, you won't get the guys saying this because they're so modest about such things. But I asked the question, how many lives were saved that day yeah. uh, having regard for the fact that this guy then and continues to save lives on a daily basis with his surgical skills. It's, it's just a one-off. It's a nice little uh, uh, footnote to it. A funny one. Last week, last week uh, we were paged uh, for a windsurfer that had been seen in the water to be in difficulty. He'd fallen off his board. He became exhausted, cold, hypothermic, couldn't get back onto his board. But at least half an hour had elapsed between people first seeing it and then plucking up the courage to dial 999 and report it. We launched and went with the usual haste, found the guy in the water, pulled him into the lifeboat. Uh, I think they had to take this hood off or whatever, you know, like a balaclava. Yeah, yeah. When they pulled it off and, and took one look at him, they were, f they were looking at a 75-year-old <laughs> gentleman who does this windsurfing as a bit of a... A pastime, you know, between collecting his pensions. Brilliant. Um, you know, these these are the sort of jobs. I mean, we we can go on. Yeah. We can go on and on. Have I got time to tell you about a Polish family quickly? Mm. Polish family caught, caught under the cliff, trapped under the cliff at Saltburn, in the dark, pager. <laughs> that's off, that's no. not stage managed. <laughs> <laughs> That's the sound of the lifeboat pages don't, going off. Don't worry, my colleague. It's a, my colleague gets it's it. It's a test. It's a test. It's a test. It's, oh, it's 9.30 Sunday morning. 8.30 Sunday, Sunday morning. 8.30 Sunday morning, exactly. I'm, I'm That's what it is. There you go. We, we'll try and get the Polish story at some point. However, um, at BBC Radio Leicester, things continue in the normal way of things. And at yeah. half past eight, it's time for traffic and travel news. Going, madam. Indeed, I am. It's going very well, actually. Um, you heard just before eight o'clock, the pages went off, um, and uh, one by one, uh, various crew members are kind of drifting in because on a Sunday morning, um, the lifeboat is taken on a uh, on a kind of test exercise. Um, so, um, so all that will be going on a little bit later on. I think in the background, can I hear the Mask Fisherman's Choir singing? Oh, you might. And carry us home. about these guys then monica there you go well i will tell you about them they're a, a, a very handsome bunch of men um who were singing yesterday at the naming ceremony for the leicester challenge 2 here in redcar mask is just a little bit further along the coast um from redcar and uh, they are a, a fisherman's choir beautiful authentic voices and uh, singing their home from the sea and they were they kind of led the the hymn singing and the singing generally at the naming ceremony yesterday um, I have to say, they're a very abstemious lot here at Red Car Lifeboat Station because I've had a birthday box of chocolates um, from the Leicester branch of the RNLI. I've opened it, offered them around. Nobody's had one yet, <laughs> so I'll bring one back for you, Rupert. Oh, I look forward to um, it. There is one more person to hear from this morning, and uh, he is the senior helmsman here at Red Car. His name is Mike Picknett, and yesterday uh, we had quite an emotional chat. Um, it didn't start off emotionally, but it, it ended up um, quite quite movingly we started off mike and i about talking the talking about the differences between an atlantic 75 and the leicester challenge 3 which is an atlantic 85. well apart from the obvious being a little bit bigger a little bit longer a little bit wider the biggest things the biggest advantage to us a little bit more power so we're, we're a bit quicker getting from A to B, but more importantly, towing other vessels is easier for us. You hinted earlier at the kind of jobs you get called out to. You mentioned towing, you mentioned casualties. The Lifeboat Leicester Challenge 3 has already been in service since March. It's yes. just that today was the naming ceremony. Do you know how many incidents, what kind of incidents are there? Typical incidents for this part of the coast? Yeah, she's done about 22 calls. Could have used her today, actually, if we'd wanted to. But we, we did, she was all polished, and I didn't want to get it dirty <laughs> immediately before the naming ceremony. Whilst I'm sure, to be fair, people would have loved to have seen it do a rescue today. We, we could use the other boat, so. But yeah, about 22 calls, 
it's done everything from towing fishing vessels to uh, kids in dinghies to kite surfers and wind surfers, people cut off by the tide, all the normal stuff that lifeboat stations get throughout the year. Uh, and like all stations, a bit busier in the summer than we are in the winter, but we've got our own full-time fishing fleet here and uh, in ports not, not far from here, so we, we tend to be reasonably busy in the winter as well. So yeah, she's, she's done, done a good job so far. And you're looking forward to many years of service. It was 10 years since we were here last time for Leicester Challenge 2. You're presumably expecting a similar length of devoted service from Leicester Challenge 3. Yes, but I won't. Hopefully, this boat will see me out because in just over five years I'm finished, uh, which will be, um, yeah, about 32 years I will have... 33 years I'll have been on the boat by then, which is long enough. But my son is um, approaching 17, uh, next year, he's he's part of the the young generation who uh, who comes down to trading, and he's he's learning his skills. So hopefully he'll he'll be on the crew and, and carry on. It's how to make a radio journalist feel very old because I remember him <laughs> as a little lad clambering all over the the original boat we were for. Nearly seventeen. That's amazing. Yeah, yes. Yeah. And it really does run in families, doesn't it? It's it does. Lifeboat. I mean, yeah. I mean, I'm I'm tra you know fortunate that traditionally my family we've we've crewed lifeboats in Red Car since 1802, predating the RNLI by some 20 odd years, but, and the boat is still here in the museum. So we've, we've had a continuous uh, picnic on the crew in Red Car since 1802, and hopefully my son will carry that on. Can I ask you, I was at Pool about three or four weeks ago, the RNLI Memorial. Yes. Are there not yes. three picnics? on there who were they they are they are my uh, great grandfather's brother and his two sons who were all drowned trying to rescue the crew of a trawler called the honoria in 1902 so yes three of my family are on are on that and i was fortunate enough to be invited to the dedication and opening of that memorial uh, which was quite a proud uh, proud moment for me uh, very to... moving i should think but but just demonstrates that even with a tragic history in your family, you were still never going to turn your back on the lifeboat. No, and, and even at, I mean, at that time in the 1900s, when when the crew was made, you know, when you needed about 14 or 15 crew then to to to, to, to man the lifeboats, um, at times six, seven, or even eight of of my family and other families had similar numbers because it was two or three fishing families in Redcar then, and those they predominantly provided most of the crew for the lifeboat. So it wasn't unusual to have. Uh, three or four brothers and three or four nephews uh, of those people all in the boat at the same time. And when something went wrong, often it went wrong for a number of the same family. Uh, as lifeboat disasters and even the, the, you know, the last big disaster, the Penalee disaster, you know, families were, were devastated by that because more than one person from the same family can, can be affected. So, um, yeah, very much a family history thing for me and it's going to be, it won't be, um, it won't be an easy day. Not looking forward to it. No. Not at all. That's uh, senior helmsman Mike Picknett at the Red Car Lifeboat talking. Lots and lots of birthdays. Can I just say, Monica, before we go, yes. you've got a very, yes. very special birthday wish coming to you right now, live from Red Car and the Lifeboat Station. Take it away, guys. Monica, Monica, this... Gareth Marone set this up for us. Did you really? This is, this is our one and only rendition. You ready, chaps? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Monica. Happy birthday to you. Thank you. Thank you. Present I've ever had, ever. Thank you very much indeed, lads. Thank you. What a great uh, You're going to get your clubhouse back any minute now because we've we've got to go. But th oh, oh, are you, thank are you, you. Are you all right? Well arranged. Are you all I'm right? I'm fine. I'm a little overcome, <laughs> but yes.